I thought I might just give a, uh, a little overview. D David just spoken about one, uh, the, the American Diabetes Association uh, guidelines. I thought it might be quite interesting for us to, to review the sort of guidelines that are out there by the various organisations and to see how they're approaching the whole low carb, or if they're approaching the low carb issue, and if so, how are they approaching the low carb issue? So what I'm going to do is uh, in the next, uh, not that long now, um, <laughs> is, uh, is look at three different uh, areas, if you like. The diabetes groups, so the national diabetes groups, the heart groups, and the dietitians. And I'm going to, just for the sake of, uh, of, of keeping it within sort of uh, an hour or two, um, I'm going to look at the, the Australian groups, and in, def in, in deference to our two international visitors, the English or the British groups, and the American groups. And just have a look at what those organisations are doing or have done at the moment and the way they're addressing the low carb situation. Okay, so let's start with the diabetes bodies, the various uh, bodies around, uh, around the world. We'll start off in Australia and um, in 2018 the Diabetes Australia produced this uh, position statement on low carbohydrate eating for people with diabetes. So let's have a look what they, uh, what they had to say. So. A few uh, motherhood statements to start with. Uh, low carb eating's uh, gained popularity. Uh, some people have found it useful. You know, some people have found it useful. Uh, low carb diets are popular because they're relatively easy to follow and they're heavily promoted in the media. That's the only reason they're popular. <laughs> low carb eating has also gained interest for some people with diabetes as one option to help lose weight and to assist in managing their blood glucose levels. So. The, the language is very interesting. You'll find a common theme through all these position statements. The language is very, uh, yes, you'll see. Um, the next thing for people with uh, type 2 diabetes, there is reliable evidence that lower carb eating can be safe and useful. That's good. Uh, all people with any type of diabetes who wish to follow a low carb diet should do so in consultation with their diabetes healthcare team because they need the business. And People with diabetes considering low carb eating are encouraged to seek personalised advice from an accredited practising dietitian. Probably the last thing you would want to do if you had diabetes. <laughs> and people with diabetes considering low carb eating should be aware of possible side effects, uh, such as tiredness, headaches and nausea, and seek advice. And we've all had those, haven't we? Constantly, you know, constant uh, falling asleep all the time. And seek advice from their healthcare team if concerned. And then finally, apart from those side effects, low carb eating may not be safe and not recommended for children, pregnant or breastfeeding women, people at risk of malnutrition, don't know what that means really, people with kidney or liver failure, now that goes against what David just said, or those with a history of disordered eating. So you have to say it's not exactly a strong endorsement. So in summary, Diabetes Australia recognises that low-carb eating can be an effective way of reducing blood glucose levels and achieving weight loss. However, low-carb eating is not suitable for everyone, including children, people with type 2 diabetes. I like this one. People with type 2 diabetes with specialised nutrition requirements. <laughs> Doesn't everyone with type 2 diabetes have specialised nutrition requirements? Anyway, at this stage there is not enough evidence of benefits or safety of low-carb eating for people with type 1 diabetes. I don't know what they're reading, but they can't find any evidence of, uh, of that. And you've got to get in the saturated fat bit. And sure, fat intake includes mostly unsaturated fats and only small amounts of saturated fats. So that's Diabetes Australia. They've addressed the issue, but you have to say they haven't wildly, uh, not wild enthusiasm there. What about our friends in the, in the UK? I thought I'd just put up a typical uh, English uh, scene here. <laughs> Seen from, uh, from a recent picture of London uh, with a, uh, a gasometer in the background and, um, yeah, just a typical London scene, really. Um, what about Diabetes uh, UK? Now, in 2017, a year earlier, they put out a, a, a statement on low-carb diets for people with diabetes. So let's see what they had, to, uh, they had to say. In response to many inquiries from people with diabetes, etc., etc., Diabetes UK has produced this information to clarify our position on carbohydrates based on their evidence-based nutrition guidelines. As the total amount of carbohydrate eaten has the biggest effect on the rise of blood glucose levels, some experts have argued that everyone with diabetes should follow a low-carbohydrate diet. However, this call for low-carb diets 
is based on opinions rather than robust science. Unlike the guidelines for the last 40 years, which of course have been very robust science. I can't have been able to find them, but I'm sure if I could find them, they'd be very robust. <laughs> so there's a theme here, isn't there? There's a recurring theme. Weight management should be the primary nutritional strategy. Restricting the calorie intake can lead to weight loss, and there are a variety of ways to achieve calorie restriction and weight loss. So what they're trying to say is that low carb is just one of the many ways of uh, restricting calorie intake. Some people with type 2 diabetes may choose to follow a low-carb diet in order to lose weight and to manage their blood glucose. The implication that, well, you'd be an idiot if you did, but you may choose to do that. <laughs> there is evidence to suggest that low-carb diets are safe and effective, so at least we've got, uh, got that far, but in the short term for improvements. There is no clear indication that they're superior to other approaches in the long term. Individual studies have looked at the effectiveness of low-carb diet and the management of type 2 diabetes have reported inconsistent differences in glycemic control, weight, blood lipids and blood pressure between diets low in carbohydrates and diets high in carbohydrates. Yes, inconsistent. Some of them are incredibly effective and some of them are just very effective. <laughs> Recent systematic reviews and meta-analyses including people with type 2 diabetes report that although low-carb diets may lead to significantly greater weight loss and improvements in HbA1c and lipids over the short term, there is no greater advantage over the longer term when compared to other diets. And they list four references there. Of the many, many references, they've for some reason just picked out four, which happens to support what they say. Studies on very low-carb ketogenic diets have suggested that these may not be sustain sustainable over a medium to longer term as carbohydrate intake in the different diets within studies often converge towards a more moderate level. That's a bizarre statement really, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, we won't go there. So their recommendations at the end of their, uh, their statement. A low carbohydrate should not, diet should not be regarded as a more superior or a better approach than other strategies as consistent evidence shows that total energy intake is the main predictor for weight loss. There we go. Calories in, calories out. Where are you, Gary? Yeah. When considering a low-carb diet as an option, people with diabetes should be made aware of possible side effects, such as the risk of hypoglycemia, common side effect, and should be supported to manage such risks. People who want to follow a low-carb diet should ensure that their fat intake comes mainly from unsaturated sources while limiting saturated fat intake. They should also include foods in high in fibre. Dr. Mason, any comments on that? <laughs> Finally, there's no, currently no strong evidence to be recommended low carb as an option for people with type 1 diabetes. We would argue with that, and I'm sure Troy Stapleton would, uh, would argue with that. And there are serious concerns, I love this one, serious concerns about low carb diets for children with diabetes due to effects on growth. Therefore, low carb diets should not be recommended for children with diabetes. Probably the most important people that need to have low-carb diets. So that, that really sort of uh, disturbed me, that, that bit about the kids. So they had some references there. So I went and had a look at the, at the references. And the main reference they use is this, uh, is this um, case series of endocrine and metabolic consequences due to low-carb diets. And uh, there was a case series that illustrated that carbohydrate restriction in growing children can lead to anthropometrical deficits and a higher cardiovascular risk metabolic profile. Further fatigue and low enjoyment of sports was reported. So there's a bunch of, of cases uh, from medical practitioners that uh, had negative, uh, negative comments. What they said further, further on in that article, the likely mechanism is that carbohydrate restriction without compensatory energy intake through other macronutrients, fat and protein, leads to a deficit in total energy intake. So it really had nothing to do with the fact that it was low carb. It was just the fact that they didn't compensate by, uh, by having increased energy. But Diabetes UK sort of didn't quite get that, I don't think. Whereas we know that there are a number of other studies. Um, this one from David Ludwig's group showing uh, exceptional glycemic control of type 1 uh, diabetes with low rates of adverse events reported by community 
of children and adults who consumed. That was the type one, the, the type one grit uh, study. And then our own uh, wonderful Jess Turton uh, came up, uh, did a systematic review and showed that eight out of nine studies reported a mean change in HbA1c in uh, type 1 diabetics. So really it's very much selective uh, evidence and not even good quality evidence. So Diabetes UK with uh, some other organisations put out these evidence-based guidelines for the prevention and management of diabetes. So they're supported by the dietitians and by Primary Care Diabetes Association and uh, the Association of British um, Clinical Diabetologists all got together and uh, supported this. And I won't go through that, uh, that whole thing, but you can see there in the halfway down, dietary patterns associated with reduced risk in general populations include Mediterranean, DASH, vegetarian and vegan, the Nordic healthy diet, and moderate carbohydrate restriction. Nothing about severe or you know, very low carbohydrate, it's all just moderate carbohydrate description. What's happening at the moment in the UK is that there is a joint scientific advisory committee on nutrition with NHS England and Diabetes UK. Uh, they've commissioned a working group to review the evidence on lower carb <coughs> diets for adults with type 2 diabetes. And they're due to report their findings next year, 2020, um, and uh, they'll make recommendations based on that, uh, on that review. So that should be very interesting. It's interesting to look at the comp composition of that working group. Um, David's already mentioned uh, Roy Taylor, who uh, has done that research on, uh, on low calorie diets and, and diabetes. And I think, you know, I don't know what you think, David, but there's a reasonable chance that these people might, uh, might come up with, uh, with some good, uh, good results. However, this scientific, uh, um, this SACN group, Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition, recently put out something on saturated fat and health. And uh, the results of that don't inspire me with a lot of uh, confidence that they'll get it right about, uh, about low carb. This is what Zoe Harkham had to say about uh, a few aspects of that, uh, that review. When reviewing the draft report, Zoe found the SACN had done five things to try to make a case against saturated fat. Uh, they presented duplicated studies and studies that simply reported other studies, which gave the appearance of there being more evidence supporting it. They left out some studies, all of which found evidence of no effect. They presented uh, non-significant results as significant. They looked for and reported fixed effect methodology when the random effects methodology concluded there was no significant findings and they ignored evidence that didn't suit them. So that doesn't really inspire me, that, uh, but hopefully this next committee will do a, do a better job. As we know, the diabetes, there's an alternative diabetes group in, uh, in the UK, which is uh, diabetes.co.uk, which is not the official group, which is really a, a, a low-carb uh, group. That's incredibly popular. They have a low-carb program that you're probably all familiar with. At, uh, costs, I think, 90 pounds to do this uh, program, and they've had over 400,000 people do this low-carb program. They have 300,000 people on their diabetes forum. So this is the alternative side of diabetes in the UK, and I think numbers, numbers talk. What about, uh, there's a, an interesting uh, consensus report that came out a combination of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, the EASD, and the American Diabetes Association, which David referred to. They put, uh, put out a uh, statement last year saying that low-carbohydrate diets produce substantial reduction in HbO1c at three months and six months with diminishing effects at 12 and 14. No benefit of moderate carbohydrate restriction was observed. So the American Diabetes Association is interesting. They... Uh, they have this document called the Standards of Medical Care in Diabetes, and they updated that last, uh, last December. And one of the chapters was on lifestyle management. And what they said in that was that there are a variety of eating patterns acceptable for the management of diabetes. The Mediterranean dietary approach, the DASH, um, and plant-based diets are examples of healthful eating patterns that have shown positive results. Research indicates that low carbohydrate eating plans may result in improved glycemia and have the potential to reduce antihypoglycemic medications for individuals with type 2 diabetes. Very good. As research studies on some low carb eating plans generally indicate challenges with long term sustainability, it's important to reassess and individualise meal plan guidance. The meal plan is not recommended at this time for women who are pregnant or lactating people with or at risk for disordered eating or people who have renal disease should be used in caution 
with people taking uh, SGL2 inhibitors, which we agree with. There is inadequate research in type 1 diabetes to support one eating plan over another. And that's so sad that they, uh, they come to that, uh, that conclusion. And in their summary, they just had a single line saying a variety of eating patterns are acceptable for the management of type 2 diabetes. As David Unwin mentioned, they more recently, in, uh, in April or May this year, published a consensus report. And David referred to that. And there were some very uh, good names on that, uh, that author list, Laura Saslow and Bill Yancey and so on. And not surprisingly, with good people there, they came up with some much better uh, results. These are the consensus recommendations from that consensus report. Firstly, a variety of eating patterns are acceptable. Fine. Secondly, uh, we, should we should focus on key factors such as non-starchy veg, minimising sugars and refined grains, and choosing whole foods over highly processed foods. All pretty good. This is what David referred to. Reducing overall carbohydrate intake has demonstrated the most evidence for improving glycemia. Now that is, a, as David mentioned, a remarkable statement. The first time that any of these official organisations have said anything like that. And that reducing overall carbohydrate intake with low or very low carbohydrate eating plans is a viable approach. Drilling down into that consensus statement, uh, there's a couple of other interesting paragraphs in there that I wanted to, to show you. Firstly, despite a lot of the other organisations saying there is insufficient evidence for low-carb programs, they've actually said these eating patterns are among the most studied eating patterns for type 2 diabetes. I've obviously found a lot of studies that these other organisations haven't. And interestingly about saturated fats, they say most of the trials using a carb-restricted eating pattern did not restrict saturated fat. From the current evidence, this eating pattern does not appear to increase overall cardiovascular risk. Again, quite a different statement to all the others. So I think it's been a pretty exciting uh, uh, development, as, as David, uh, David pointed out. So a lot of difference between the Australian, the UK and the American Diabetes Associations. All right, let's talk about the heart associations and I'll uh, rush through these fairly, uh, fairly quickly because I know you all want to get to lunch, not that we're hungry anymore, but you know, that's... Uh, um, let's talk about uh, the different heart associations in the, three, in the three countries. Firstly, we'll start with the Americans. The American Heart Association has diet and lifestyle recommendations on their, on their website and it's to eat an overall healthy dietary pattern, the usual thing, variety of fruit and veg, whole grains, low fat dairy, skinless poultry, nuts and legumes, non-tropical vegetable oils. Limit saturated fat, sodium, red meats and so on. One of the diets that fits this pattern is the DASH approach and most healthy eating patterns can be adapted based on calorie requirements and personal and cultural food differences. All pretty, uh, pretty depressing stuff, really. It probably hasn't changed in the last 30 or 40 years. Recently, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association have put out a, uh, a guidelines on clinical practice guidelines. And they're, uh, they're quite interesting. If we look at the recommendations of the, for nutrition and diet, number one, a diet emphasising intake of vegetables, fruit, legumes, nut, whole grains and fish. Replacement of saturated fat with dietary monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. A diet containing reduced amounts of cholesterol and sodium can be beneficial. I don't know where they get those references from, but that's not uh, the consensus. As part of a healthy diet, it's reasonable to minimise the intake of processed meats, refined carbohydrates and sweetened beverages. And finally, as part of a healthy diet, the intake of trans fat should be avoided. They also go on to say long-standing dietary patterns that focus on low intake of carbohydrates and high intake of animal fat are associated with increased cardiac and non-cardiac mortality rate. In one meta-analysis, low-carbohydrate diets were associated with a 31% higher rate risk of all-cause death with increased cardiac mortality rate. Remarkable how you can find one paper among uh, literally dozens that uh, shows that result. This was the, the, the study the uh, ARIC, the uh, Atherosclerosis Risk in Community Study, an 18% increase in mortality rate with low-carbohydrate diets using animal-derived protein and fat sources. But plant sources were associated with lower mortality rate. So, the vegans are everywhere. <laughs> in conclusion, a diet high in fruit, vegetables and whole grains is best. Fish, legumes and poultry are the preferred sources of protein. Minimising consumption of trans fat added sugars, red meats, sodium and saturated fats 
is also important. So the American Heart Association. What about in Australia? Well, some of you may have seen the headlines recently that the, Australia, the Heart Foundation Australia has come out with some, uh, some revised guidelines. And there was some publicity. Here you can see a healthy heart's nice and cheesy. Why full fat milk is back in favour. New advice from the Heart Foundation on meat, dairy and eggs. What was that advice? It was in, uh, I think it came out in August. Gary Jennings, who's their chief medical advisor, we've introduced a limit on meat, limit of less than 350 grams a week for unprocessed beef, lamb, pork and veal. That's about one to three lean red meat meals a, a week. Processed or deli meat should be limited. People should get most of their heart healthy protein. Not sure what heart healthy protein is, but heart healthy protein from plant sources such as beans, lentils and tofu, as well as fish and seafood, with a smaller amount of eggs and lean poultry. Heart healthy eating is more about combination of foods. So they would rather we had tofu than red meat. As far as dairy goes, we've removed our restriction. For, no apologies for having had a restriction on there for 40 years and <laughs> condemning us all to horrible skim milk for 40 years. We've removed our restriction on healthy, uh, isn't that kind of them, on eating full fat milk, cheese and yogurt. While the evidence was mixed, this type of dairy was found to have a neutral effect. Many studies show a positive effect, but they just say a neutral effect and doesn't increase or decrease your risk of heart attack. However, that's if you're normal. But if you suffer high cholesterol or heart disease, out the window, we still want unflavoured, reduced fat milk, yoghurt and cheese. And eat less than seven eggs a week. Who eats more than seven eggs a week? You're all in trouble. <laughs> Watch those tickers. <laughs> now this is my favourite line. Butter, cream, ice cream and dairy based desserts are not recommended as heart healthy. So they've linked butter and cream with ice cream and dairy based desserts in the one sentence. As if they're all the same. Bizarre. So they contain higher fat. And then at the bottom, we now advise people with type 2 diabetes to eat fewer than 7 eggs per week as growing evidence suggests an increased risk with eating more eggs. <laughs> Bizarre. Anyway, so initially I got really excited when I saw all this, you know, this headlines about you know, the, the Heart Foundation and less in improving dairy and so on. When you drill down to it, it's still pretty, uh, pretty compromised. Oh, and the last thing, eating more plant-based foods like vegetables, fruit and whole grains and healthy proteins like fish and seafood with smaller amounts of animal-based foods or cutting down on highly processed junk foods is the key to good heart health. Their recommendations, based on that evidence, plenty of vegetables, variety of healthy protein sources, especially fish and seafood, legumes, nuts and seeds. Smaller amounts of eggs and lean poultry can also be included. If choosing red meat, make sure the meat is lean and limit to one to three times a week. Unflavoured milk, yogurt and cheese. Those with high blood cholesterol though, should choose reduced fat varieties, etc., etc. For people who would benefit from LDL lowering dietary intervention, they don't actually say who that is or whatever, but apparently there are some people who would benefit, we've got to work that out. Choosing reduced fat and unflavoured milk, yogurt and cheese at less than seven eggs a week is recommended. Anyway, all right, that's the Australian Heart Foundation. What about our, uh, our uh, British friends? Uh, oh, I don't know how that's popped in there. Anyway, must be from another talk I gave. Anyway, um, the British Heart Foundation. Healthy eating, a balanced diet. Plenty of fruit and veg, plenty of starchy foods. You like that? The British Heart Foundation. Plenty of starchy foods. I often have, obviously haven't heard David's lecture about what a starch is. Bread, rice, potatoes and pasta. Can you believe that? Try to eat plenty of bread, rice, potatoes and pasta because that'll give you heart attacks and we'll have lots of business. Yes! <laughs> some milk and dairy products, some meat, fish, eggs, beans and other non-dairy and only a small amount of foods and drinks high in fats and sugars. Choose options that are lower in fat, salt and sugar whenever you can. And then they specifically talk about high protein or high fat diets as if they're the sort of same thing. And Atkins, you know, e.g. Atkins, that's just a high protein diet. What do they say about that? Do high protein diets work? 
Well, you may lose weight quickly at first. There's no evidence these diets are any more effective in the long term. High fat diets can be unhealthy too. While fats are important, too much fat will unbalance the diet. Take care if you've got high blood pressure. Processed meats like bacon and sausages can mean the diet is high in salt, etc., etc. All right, last but not least, I'm saving the best till last, our friends, the dietitians. <laughs> All right, let's start in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the US where the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is their main uh, dietitian's professional body. They don't actually have a particular low-carb policy or position statement, unlike all the other organisations we've talked about. They do, I had a look through their website and they have this on children need carbohydrates. In recent years, several fad diets, I wonder what they're referring to there, have recommended the reduction or even elimination of carbohydrates from our everyday diets. But are such low-carb diets good for a child? While a reduction of certain types of carbohydrates, such as added sugars, may be beneficial for our children's growing bodies, removing all carbohydrates are not. Well, you can't remove all carbohydrates anyway, so it's a nonsensical uh, statement, really. They do have a page on what is the ketogenic diet. The ketogenic diet is quite restrictive. <laughs> Research supports the eating pattern for epilepsy when ma managed along with a health team, since its treatment can be very complex. But of course, nothing else would work if it works for epilepsy. However, with regards to the keto diet as a tool for weight loss and other health benefits, the jury is still out. Well, I'm not sure who is in their jury, but uh, <laughs> they're not a jury that I'd like to be judged by, I can assure you. And finally, they love the Mediterranean diet. Make it Mediterranean. You've probably heard that the Mediterranean diet can make your heart healthier, protect against cancer, and even help you live longer. But did you know it's also a great pick for kids? Anyway. All right, let's, uh, let's go to England, shall we? And, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Dear, oh dear. I don't know who those drunk people are. Terrible. All right, the, the, the BDA, the Association of UK Dietitians. In November 2018, they put out this position statement on low-carb diets for the management of type 2 diabetes in adults. I won't go through it all, but the BDA believes that low-carb diets can be effective in managing weight, improving glycemic control and cardiovascular risk in people in the short term, less than 12 months. This is probably due to the accompanying reduction in energy intake and subsequent weight loss. More research is needed to determine the effect of long-term adherence over 12 months. More research is needed to identify the best dietary pattern to ensure good glycemic control. Weight loss is still the cornerstone of management of type 2 diabetes. There is insufficient evidence, insufficient evidence. How many RCTs were there? 62? There is insufficient evidence to indicate that low-carbohydrate diets are a superior or better approach than other strategies for weight loss and subsequent weight maintenance in the long term. You just wonder who comes up with these statements. It's amazing. When considering a low-carbohydrate diet as an option, people with diabetes who are on certain drugs, including insulin, should be made aware of possible side effects. What, the side effects of the insulin or the side effects of... Anyway. And people with type 2 diabetes who choose... In other words, you know, you idiots who choose to follow a low-carbohydrate diet should be supported by a dietitian. Well, that's probably the last thing you want to be. But, uh, <laughs> well spent. <laughs> Sorry, Nicole. We do have a low-carb dietitian in the audience. <laughs> All right. And last but not least, I know it's nearly lunchtime. Our good old DAA, the Dietitians Association of Australia, and in November 2017, they put out this statement on low-carb, high-fat diets for diabetes. Low-carbohydrate, high-fat diets have recently re-emerged, having last been popular in the 1970s, and have caught the attention of some members of the scientific community and the public. <laughs> Dietitians want to make the management of diabetes mellitus easier and strive to provide the best possible advice to the public as the nutrition science continues to, to evolve. So what about the low-carb, high-fat is it really the best if you have diabetes? And is it sustainable? Fascinating questions. <laughs> but, um, DAA acknowledges that there is no one best diet for managing type 2 diabetes. There are a range of beneficial nutrition interventions which may be recommended by a practicing dietitian. 
APDs are trained at taking into account factors such as person's nutrition needs, well, one would hope so, uh, background and preferences, and then tailor medical nutrition therapy to an individual. There are a range of carbohydrate intakes that can assist with diabetes management. Yes, some will make them worse and some will make them better. Anyway, a low carbohydrate, high healthy fat diet may be used by some nutrition professionals in the short term, although we'll expel them from the DAA, but that's another matter, <laughs> to achieve particular health goals. This approach won't be for everyone, but for some people it might be worth trying, with support from an APD, who doesn't believe in it, to ensure nutritional adequacy, to help identify healthier protein and fat sources, and to assist with long-term adherence. It's important to remember, though, that the efficacy and safety of low-carbohydrate diets has not been examined in the longer term. There are no clinical trials of two years or more examining the health effects. Clarity is needed provided the definition or description of low-carb diets that have in some studies been associated with weight loss or improved metabolic profile. What we do know is that eating a wide variety of nutritious foods in the right amount is crucial to optimal health. And the best diet for eating one is you can maintain, one you can maintain over the long term. Lastly, DAA recommends people with diabetes seek advice and ongoing support and monitoring from a health professional, such as a dietitian. All right, enough of these position statements. Where are we at? What's happening? What can we deduce from all of these? Well, what does it mean? It means low carb, certainly on the agenda. I mean, two or three years ago, there were no position statements on low carb. So they didn't feel the need. So all these organisations have felt the need to make a comment on low carb because of us. All these organisations have been forced to address the issue, albeit reluctantly, as you can see from their, from their language. They're prepared to admit that low carb diets are safe and that low carb diets may be effective. But they all say they're not shown to be safe in the long term. They all talk about potential health risks, kidney, cardiovascular. They're still concerned about saturated fat. They say there's no evidence for type 1. And remarkably, they say that it's dangerous for children. So, while we've made some progress, there's still a long way to go. But I think with people like Rod and David and Gary Taubes, we can do it. <laughs> Thank you very much.